Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate National Dairy Month by taking a closer look at considerations for the health of people and planet when it comes to dietary protein, as well as how plant foods and animal foods complement each other to help us build not only healthy, but sustainable and delicious eating patterns. I'm Sally Cummins, and I'm Vice President of Sustainable Nutrition Affairs for National Dairy Council, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. But before we get started, I wanted to share just a few reminders. Uh, for optimal experience, we recommend you use Google Chrome or Firefox as your browser. And if you experience any technical difficulties, just reach out via the chat window on the left side of your screen, and someone will be there to assist you. And you can also type any questions into that same chat window. Uh, and we'll answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. So um, enter your questions, and then we'll hold them all and address them at the end. And as a reminder, you'll receive all continuing education certificates and handouts within 24 hours. And the webinar will be posted next week at usdairy.com. For those of you not familiar with National Dairy Council, NDC is a nonprofit organization founded in 1915 by dairy farmers because they believed in science and the importance of understanding how dairy foods may benefit human nutrition and health. And today, NDC represents about 40,000 dairy farm families across the U.S. as well as dairy importers. On behalf of America's dairy farmers, our diverse team of scientists, registered dietitian nutritionists, and communications professionals strive to bring to life the dairy community's shared vision of a healthy, happy, sustainable world, all with science as our foundation. And this is more relevant today than ever before as we're challenged with not only feeding but nourishing nearly 10 billion people around the globe while honoring our planet and natural resources. I'm just advancing slides here. One moment, please. There we go. Um, but what you might not know is America's dairy farmers are committed to nourishing people while taking care of the planet. In 2010, it was confirmed that the U.S. dairy community accounts for only about 2% of US, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And a recent study in the Journal of Animal Science captured here on the screen found through continuous improvement due to contributions from pre precision breeding, innovation, and the development and adoption of manure management practices and on-farm technology, producing a gallon of milk can be produced today using 19% less greenhouse gas emissions, 21% less land, and 30% less, less water than in, 20, in 2007. The U.S. dairy community is committed to continuous improvement, and studies like this one show we're making progress, but that's not our end game. Now more than ever, our work and the environment is vital, and our commitment to it remains steadfast. And I'm excited to share that just last month, the dairy community announced an aggressive sustainability targets for 2050, including ambitions to become carbon neutral, or better, greenhouse gas emissions, optimizing water use while maximizing water recycling, and improving water quality. And you'll find more information on this in the follow-up email you'll receive after the webinar but I invite you to join us on this journey to become an environmental solution to the challenges of nourishing growing global population and protecting the Earth's natural resources. But the reality is, just slides are a little sticky today. Um, the reality is everyone has a role to play in sustainable future. So I'm happy to call your attention to two new publications that will be linked in your follow-up email as well. In June, the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics features a framework for action for how food and nutrition professionals individually, as a profession, and in collaboration with other sectors can cultivate sustainable food systems. This framework for action was developed from a roundtable meeting of experts convened, convened by the Academy's foundation as part of the Future of Food Initiative, which was funded through an educational grant from National Dairy Council. And the participants included credentialed nutrition and dietetic practitioners, as well as stakeholders with expertise in agriculture, food supply chains, environmental science, economics, racial equity, food policy, and clinical nutrition. Also recently, the Gen Youth Foundation um, just launched the Youth of Future of Food, which has some really phenomenal insights 
and information related to what kids are thinking about nutrition these days. And again, this will be in your follow-up email. And when it comes to sustainable nutrition, we know that protein and plant-based diets is top of mind for trend spotters and health experts alike. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by one of the leading protein researchers, Dr. Don Lehman, and registered dietitian and award-winning cookbook author, Toby Amador, as they take a closer look at what the science says about protein quality, quantity, and its impact on the environment and public health, and as well as how plant foods and animal foods complement each other to help build healthy, sustainable, and delicious habits. And as I turn it over to Dr. Lehman, I want to note he was my professor at University of Illinois, and I know he could develop an entire semester's worth of information on the content we've asked him to cover today. So I'm very appreciative of his ability to provide this perspective in our short time together. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lehman. Thank you so much, Sally, for the introduction, and thanks to everyone out there who has joined us on the uh, webinar. I'm sure we've all heard a lot of discussion about plant-based diets and benefits for both health and the environment. And on the surface, it seems like a fairly straightforward idea, but it, it's actually a very complex topic, and a lot of the complexity revolves around creating a sustainable diet for protein. So those are my, my uh, disclosures. I do a lot of consulting with a lot of different companies, and so those are current involvements. Um, I think we all have a lot of uh, views of, of uh, what a plant-based diet looks like, and I think a lot of us as professional nutritionists would immediately think about broccoli and cauliflower and blueberries and avocados, but I think it's important to step back and ask what the average public thinks about it. I think one of the things to remember is we've had plant-based dietary guidelines since the 1970s when the uh, Surgeon General came out with the dietary guidelines to reduce cholesterol and saturated fat. Then in the 1980s, we got the Food Guide Pyramid, which recommended reducing eggs and milk and or limiting eggs and milk and, and meats and eating more vegetables and fruits and, and whole grains. So we've had them for a while. I think it's important to look and see what Americans are actually doing. So these are the NHANES data, and what I've got here is the 2010 data, and 2016 is about the same. And what we find is that Americans already have a plant-based diet. We get over 70% of our calories from plant-based foods and about 30% from animal-based foods. Unfortunately, within that, in the large circle, what we find is that 51% of those plant-based calories are coming from added fats, oils, and sugars. And in the small circle, another 33% are coming from refined grains. So eight, over 80% of our plant-based calories are coming from foods with very low nutritional value. So I would argue we don't really need a more plant-based diet. What we need is a diet with better plants. Further, if we look at the 30% that is from animal-derived foods, what we see is that almost 70% of our dietary protein is coming from this group, nearly 100% of calcium, vitamin D, and B12, and over 60% of iron, zinc, selenium, B6, et cetera. So one of the questions we have to ask is, what can we take out of this group? How much can we take out before we're really going to jeopardize the diet of Americans? So I want to focus on protein and try and put that in perspective. And as we think about protein, there are really three components of it, quantity, quality, and bioavailability. So let's start off with quantity. I think everybody here is probably familiar with dietary reference intakes. We know that at the minimum level, we have the RDA, which is designed to prevent deficiencies, and then a safe range up to some upper limit. And for most nutrients, like vitamin C, we kind of get it. We know that 60 milligrams of vitamin C will prevent scurvy. And for the last three or four months, most people in the United States have been taking 10 times or 100 times that RDA for their immune response. So we know that there are optimum levels for metabolic outcomes beyond just simply the, the aspect of preventing deficiency. 
If we look at that for protein, though, we take on a totally different attitude. For some reason, we look at the RDA and we consider it both the minimum and the maximum for protein. American, the, the, the RDA is 0.8 grams per kg, and Americans are eating between 0.9 and 1.0, just barely above the minimum requirement. I think it's also useful to think about it from carbohydrates. A lot of people don't even recognize we have an RDA for carbohydrates, which is set at 130 grams per day. And that's really pretty reasonable. I mean, you can have five servings of vegetables, three servings of fruit, and three servings of whole grains at 130 grams, which is right in line with my plate guidelines. But what are Americans actually doing? They're eating over 300 grams of carbohydrates per day, three times the RDA. And what are they getting for it? Well, for vegetables, for example, only 25% of the population is getting three servings of vegetables per day, not five, three, and the number one vegetable is french fries, number two is tomato sauce, ketchup, and number three is lettuce. So two-thirds of the vegetables they're eating aren't very healthy. So where are we actually really with protein needs? Contrary to the narrative that everyone eats too much protein, evidence is actually accumulating that most adults don't eat enough. In the past 15 years, research has shown that as we get older, the efficiency of protein utilization declines. This age-related decline in efficiency is called anabolic resistance. Throughout life, we have this constant need to repair and replace existing proteins. It's called protein turnover. And as we age, this process of repair and replacement becomes less efficient. And that's particularly true in skeletal muscle. As we get older, we see conditions like sarcopenia, osteoporosis, metabolic conditions like insulin resistance. They're all related to muscle health. How do we maintain muscle health? I like to think of this sort of focus on muscle as protecting muscle, and I'll refer to it more as a muscle-centric view of protein needs. And what the research has shown is that we can actually mitigate this age-related process if we increase the protein quantity or quality in the diet by optimizing intake. So if we think about the dietary reference intakes in a little different way, what the research is now showing us is that we have optimum metabolic levels at about 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kg. This type of recommendation now is becoming pretty common. So this was a paper, review paper, from an international study group uh, in 2013. And the position paper, known as the Protein Age Study, the group recommended that adults should have protein in the range of 1.0 to 1.7 grams per kg, pretty much what the area that I talked about. This was reemphasized in the 2015 Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee they made an important step forward in dietary guidelines in recognizing that there's not one single diet for everyone, that there are multiple ways to create a healthy diet. And so they created three patterns. One they called a healthy U.S. style pattern, which is more of an omnivore diet, a healthy vegetarian pattern, and a healthy Mediterranean pattern. But what I wanted to highlight from the, from the patterns is in yellow in the protein line, they recommended all of the dietary patterns should have about twice the level of protein as the RDA, between 1.2 and 1.6 grams per kg. This is all important when we start thinking about some of the environmental aspects. One of the things that's not emphasized in a lot of these environmental studies is they're all based on reducing agricultural production of protein down to the RDA. This is a table from Christian Peters at uh, Tufts University, and what he did was model the different diets from a current U.S. diet down through omnivore levels down to a vegetarian or vegan diet. And if you look in the yellow box, what you see is with each level toward a more plant-based diet, we decrease the availability of protein. And in the last column, we see we transfer those calories to carbohydrates. So is that really a good choice? One of the things also to remember about these environmental models is these aren't dietary guidelines. These are changing agriculture. 
So it's not just a recommendation. This means we're going to take protein out of the grocery store. And one of the things to keep it, or think about at least is who's going to be affected. Is it, I would argue it's going to be the elderly couple or the lower income family who can least afford to pay for it. The other two parts of protein we need to think about are quality and bioavailability. As we think about the dietary needs, we usually talk about dietary need for protein, and frankly, that's a mistake. It would be like saying that we have a dietary need for a vitamin pill. We don't really have a need for the pill. What we have is a need for the 12 vitamins inside the pill. Likewise with protein, that's just a food. We actually have a dietary requirement for the 20 amino acids and specifically the nine essential amino acids. And what I want to focus on is among the nine essential, there are four that are called limiting amino acids, lysine, methionine, tryptophan, and leucine. And these are always low or sometimes even deficient in plant foods. And for the sake of time, I'm going to highlight two, lysine and methionine, that are usually the most at risk. So these are data from Luke Van Loon in the Netherlands. And what he has done is look at lysine and methionine in different foods. And across each of the graphs in the middle, there's a dash line that represents the requirement. So what you can see in the top set of bars is the lysine is particularly low in the grains. I've highlighted the blue bars, which are, represent oat and wheat and corn, and you can see lysine is very low in the grains. Where in the gray bars, the animal products are all more than meet the requirement. In the bottom set of bars, I've highlighted the legumes. Legumes, soy and pea, are typically low in methionine and the sulfur amino acids. So this is a really busy table, but I want to highlight some numbers out of it. So this is from Paul Mohan in New Zealand. He's one of the world's experts in protein quality. So I put in two blue lines. So look at the vertical one. To the left of the vertical line, what you see across the headings, these are all isolated and purified proteins. So milk protein concentrate, whey isolate, uh, soy isolate, pea concentrate, etc. And to the right-hand side of the of the, of the table, what you have is all natural food products, all plant products. Down at the bottom, I've highlighted some of the protein quality measures. These are dyad scores. And if you just look across the yellow line, what you see is from left to right, they go from the highest numbers to the lowest numbers. So all of the plants on the right-hand side, what you see is the, the numbers are all below 0.6, 60% or less. And that's because of bioavailability and also the limiting amino acids. What you need to remember is that in the plant, protein is, is there for the sake of the plant. It's bound to the fiber in many cases, which makes it less available. So if you look at the wheat bran column, for example, you notice that the number is 0.41. What that means is it's only about 40% from a protein quality standpoint. So if you get a label based on nitrogen uh, evaluation that says you have 10 grams of protein in a wheat bran and a whole wheat product, you really only have 40% of that. You really only have 40, 4 grams that are bioavailable. So look on the left side. I've highlighted uh, some boxes at the bottom. I'm comparing now whey protein isolate with soy protein isolate. And what you can see is the values aren't strikingly different. These two isolates are sort of the same. But unfortunately, there's another nuance to it. Uh, when we look at Diaz scores, it's based on the lowest of the nine essential amino acids. But as I already mentioned, the nine aren't actually equal. So if you look up in the blue circles, what you see is that the soy protein isolate as a 0.9 is based on methionine, but the whey protein isolate is based on histidine. Histidine is the least important of the nine essential amino acids. And to my knowledge, it's never actually been shown to be essential in adults. It's essential in children and infants, but I'm not even sure it's essential in adults. And so, if we, so we're kind of comparing apples and oranges. If we compare uh, – slide in advance there. Let's see if it will. Uh, 
Okay, sorry folks, the slide's not advancing. There There it is. If we compare it directly on the amino acids between whey and soy, what you see is that on the methionine line, whey has more than twice the level of methionine as soy. And down on the lysine, the mother one that's most important, there's more than twice the advantage. So when we start thinking about blending proteins, the actual amount of these limiting amino acids become critical. So let's look a little deeper at lysine as an example. So our daily requirement for lysine is about 3.4 grams per day. And that depends a little on your body weight, but just to use that number. And then in the black box that I've drawn in, what we have are some lysine contents of, sort of some representative foods. So at the top, what you see is the animal products have between 8 and 9% of, their, of the amino acids are lysine. Where in the bottom, as I've already said, grains are particularly low in lysine. Uh, and so if we start thinking about trying to get our requirement, we can reach our daily metabolic requirement using animal proteins with about 40 grams of protein. Or if we're trying to do it with wheat, it takes 130 grams and well over 3,000 calories just to meet your lysine requirement. So a take-home message when you're comparing plants and animal protein is a plant, you can, you can meet your requirement, but it will always take more total protein and more total calories to be equal. And you say, well, why, why pick wheat? You know, soy would be much better. Well, I picked wheat for an example that I want to use, and also because wheat currently supplies more than half of the plant-based protein in the American diet. We primarily get plant-based protein from breads and cereals and wheat flours. So let's look a little deeper at that. I think in freshman nutrition, we all heard the concept of complementary proteins. Most people don't eat single proteins at meals. We eat mixtures of food, which is great. And so let's look at a complementary concept. So wheat gluten, again, which I've already said is deficient in lysine, we can pick, pair it up with beef, which is particularly re rich in lysine, and with a one gram of wheat and one gram of beef, we have a complementary protein. It's perfectly balanced. So something like a roast beef sandwich. Let's take another example. If we take something like a wheat cereal and we mix it with cow's milk, which is also rich in lysine, we can take one gram of wheat and we can balance it with one and a half grams of cow's milk but it takes over six grams of soy drink to balance out the lysine deficiency. Again, it takes more total protein and more total calories. Okay, so let's shift over to the environmental aspect and think about uh, some of the animals and the environmental question. Cattle are often at the center of this uh, condition because they uh, produce methane and methane is considered a particularly specific, you know, important greenhouse gas. I think as we look at the environmental aspect, it's important to realize this is a very complex and multifaceted kind of issue. We obviously want a diet that is low in environmental impact, but it still has to be healthy. It has to be culturally acceptable. It has to be reason, regionally meaningful. It's unlikely that People who live on an island in the Mediterranean should have exactly the same diet as people who live in Norway or Sweden. Likewise, it needs to be nutritionally adequate and safe. So we have to balance all of these things as we're thinking about sustainability and diet. As most of you are aware, we measure climate change, greenhouse gases, uh, uh, now as greenhouse gas emissions, and the primary ones are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, I'm going to focus on carbon dioxide and methane. This is a bar graph of the countries and their greenhouse emissions. And so by far the leading country for greenhouse em gas emissions is, is China, with almost double any other country. In the blue numbers, I've highlighted the percentage of greenhouse gases for the world. So China is emitting 27%. U.S. is around 14%. And in the red numbers, I've highlighted the contribution of the country from fossil fuels. 
And so what I wanted to highlight is that in developed countries, over 80% of greenhouse gases is coming from fossil fuels. Agriculture is not a big factor in, fossil, in, in developed countries. Let's shift over and just look at the United States. So these are the data from the 2020 uh, publication from the Environmental Protection Agency for the United States. And what we find is that transportation is number one, electricity and, and industry are the top three, producing almost 80% of the greenhouse gas and most of that's in the form of carbon dioxide, over 80%. Agriculture in total uh, makes up about 10%, and, and, and that is both plant and animal, so it's the combination. And everybody always uses the cow as the icon for this, but let's break it down a little farther. Um, I didn't have the 2020 breakdown for agriculture yet, so this is from my publication a year, year and a half ago in Nutrition Today. Agriculture, the largest part of greenhouse gas production in agriculture is actually plant production, crop production, and cattle produces about 3.6%, so a much smaller amount. So let's focus on cattle since they are sort of the area Cattle get a lot of blame about greenhouse gas emissions, specifically because they produce methane. But cattle also play a very unique and important role in our food system. First, they eat foods that humans and other animals can't eat, so we're actually capturing food calories and, more importantly, protein that otherwise would simply get lost in the environment. The reason they can do this is cattle have a very unusual GI tract. We're all hearing about the microbiome everywhere we turn. Well, cattle have a different microbiome, and they have, cat, they have bacteria at the front end of their GI tract in what we call a ruminant stomach. This allows them to digest very fibrous material like grasses and silage and hay and even corn stalks and wheat stubble that other species, certainly humans, can't eat. And it, it's this process of fermentation, which we call enteric fermentation, where the bacteria digest the grasses and turn it into food for the cow. It's this bacteria that produces the CO2 and the methane. So it's the bacteria producing it. So let's take a little further look at that. So we have cattle out on these grasses, and the bacteria, as they eat it, the bacteria in their ruminant stomach is decomposing it for food for the cattle, and the bacteria are releasing CO2 and methane. But if we envision that same pasture without cows on it, that grass is going to die in seasonal changes, and as that grass rots, bacteria is going to decompose it, and it's going to release the same CO2 and methane whether the cow eats it or not. The same thing happens in the compost pile in your backyard. If you put grass and leaves or food waste in your backyard compost, it begins to decompose, bacteria decompose it. It produces heat. It, you can maybe rake it around. You'll smell some nitrogen. It's basically producing the same gases. Likewise, when you clean your lettuce or your broccoli or carrot peels or throw away your apple core into the garbage and it goes into a landfill, the bacteria will rot it and it will produce CO2 and methane. So the point is, whether the cow eats it or not, it's still going to produce about the same amount. So one of the things to keep in mind about the uniqueness of cattle is, one, they're eating a tremendous amount of food that's not digestible by humans, and the second is that 75% of the CO2 and methane that they're held accountable for is actual natural forage decay. If the cow doesn't eat it, it's still going to be put into the environment just from rotting in the fields. So we've got this really unique synergy between cattle and plants that we need to keep in mind. There's one other thing that cows are unique about in that they can actually produce essential amino acids that we need. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, where do we get essential amino acids? I mean, most people would say, well, you get it from protein, or I get it from the grocery store. But I mean, before that, where did they actually originate? And so without getting into really an evolutionary discussion, 
in modern times, most of the essential amino acids are produced by bacteria. The primary source is plants. There are bacteria on the roots of plants that have the potential to fix nitrogen from the soil. They will capture it. And these plants, these roots, will generate, the bacteria will generate what are called organic amines. And these become the backbone for essential amino acids. The plant will then make the essential amino acid and, and, and incorporate it into its plant structure. So that's the good news is they can make essential amino acids. The bad news is they make it for leaves and stems and roots and grasses, which are pretty different than muscle and heart and liver and brain and human beings. So we just don't have the same amino acid needs or the same amino acid structures. The good news in all of that, though, is cattle, these ruminant cattle, can then eat the plants, and the bacteria that are in their stomachs, in these ruminant stomachs, can begin to digest these plant materials. Remember, in the plants, we have very low bioavailability because humans can't digest the fiber, and there's a lot of protein that's bound to the fibers. Well, the cattle can digest the fiber using the fiber to generate short-chain fatty acids for energy, and releasing the protein and amino acids to, that, that the cow can then absorb. Even beyond that, the bacteria in the cow's stomach can also take nitrogen, nonspecific nitrogen, and overall they can take 60 grams of really poor quality plant proteins in grasses and leaves and all kinds of forages, and they can convert it into 100 grams of high-quality protein and meat and milk. We call this upcycling. They can take 60 grams of poor quality plant proteins and upcycle it to 100 grams of nutrient dense, high quality protein. Cattle are the only animals, ruminant animals, cattle, sheep, and goats are the only animals that have this cap capacity. And it's very important to the overall food supply. So I'd like to just wrap up with uh, sort of a review article by Robin White and Mary Beth Hall, which I think is a great balance. We know that this is a balancing act of trade-offs between environment and foods. How do we have a healthy diet? How do we have sustainable agriculture? And what they found was that it's absolutely clear if we got rid of all livestock and from the food supply, all livestock, we would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but the total impact is only about 2.6% on the U.S. greenhouse gas emission, and we would be forced to eat a lot more grains, particularly corn and soybean. And as I've said earlier, one of the problems to keep in mind is that as we go to a more plant-based diet, we have to eat more total food and more total protein to meet our requirements, and we also get the risk of of not having essential amino acids. And so as I started out, one of the things that I highlighted is that as nutritionists, we tend to think about plant-based diets probably differently than the average consumer. We think about fruits and vegetables. But it's important to realize that currently, the United States is a northern climate country. So we have relatively little cap capacity to produce fruits and vegetables. Currently, we import about 50% of our fruits and 20% of our vegetables. And remember, the number one cause of greenhouse gas in the United States is transportation. So if we're going to double our fruit and vegetable intakes, as many of us would agree would be a healthy thing to do, we need to realize that 100% of that increase in fruits and nearly 50% of the increase in vegetables will all have to be imported. So again, transportation is a major issue. What's the impact of this? What's the complexity of understanding it? So I just wrap up by saying that I think all of us can create theoretical plant-based diets that are perfectly healthy. But the question we need to ask is, can the average American public do it? Do they have the food knowledge? Do they have the financial resources to do that in a healthy way? And what are the unintended consequences of beginning to change agriculture in ways that may actually deplete protein out of our resources? 
So I want to thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll uh, turn this back over to Sally and Toby. Thanks so much, Dr. Lehman. Um, that was a great overview on protein. And it certainly is a hot topic as people focus on plant-based diets. And it brings up the good question of what exactly is a plant-based diet and how can we help people build healthy and sustainable diets. So I'm thrilled that we have Toby Amador with us today to take a deeper look at that. Many of you might be familiar with Toby. She is a registered dietitian and award-winning cookbook author. In fact, I think she now has seven cookbooks on the market, including the Create Your Plate Diabetes Cookbook, um, the Best Rotisserie Chicken Cookbook, and the Greek Yogurt Kitchen Cookbook as well. Um, if you're not familiar with her from, from her cookbooks, you may be familiar with her from her regular column in Today's Dietitian, Ask, Ask the Expert, and her media, many media placements. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Toby to take a deeper look into how plants and dairy foods can complement each other. Thanks so much, Sally. Um, so I'm going to um, just start with my disclosures, which you can see here, um, and then move right along um, into what does plant-based mean. And there's really no single definition of plant-based diet, but you can see just by the headlines that there's a lot of confusion among uh, consumers as to what it is. If you look at that New York Times article on the bottom left, it discusses the differences between vegan and plant-based and adding more plants your plate. Recently, I actually authored this article in Today's Dietitian magazine. Um, it's from October 2019, where I also discussed the benefits of eating a plant-based diet and how animal foods can help balance the nutrients in those plant foods consumed. And consumers are really confused. They don't know what plant-based or plant-forward really means. And even the term, if you turn to professional, like registered dietitians, um, the definition of plant-based really varies. There's no formal definition. And even a hospital in New York City, the way they defined it as strict vegan eating. And you'll also see professionals who say it's vegetarian or inclusive of some animal food, but they don't even define what some is. Other terms you might see is flexitarian and plant-forward. Again, none of these are defined. It's a good opportunity um, for health professionals and registered dietitians to help educate consumers about better balancing plants um, and dairy foods. So let's look here. This is um, IFIC, or the International Food Information Council's annual health and food report. And you can see here, there's actually a 73% net familiarity of Americans that are familiar with the term plant-based. In the yellow box, you can see that's on the right of the slide, it says 82% of consumers tried a diet in the past year, and they have heard of plant-based diet compared to 68% who have not tried a diet. And again, this is from um, the same survey from IFIC. Um, so consumers are split on the definition of plant-based. And so let's take a look of what consumers actually think it is. And there's a split between a vegan diet in which you avoid all animal products, including eggs and dairy, which is really a vegan diet, and a diet that emphasizes min minimally processed foods that come from plants with limited consumption of animals animal meats, eggs, and dairy. But again, what does minimally processed really mean? I mean, sliced apples, that's processed to a degree, but what about dried fruit? Where would that fall? Um, what does limited consumption mean? So consumers are really confused and they don't even know the answer to those questions. Um, and in, again, in the latest 2019 IPIC survey, um, it was really interesting to see that plant-based diets first appeared in 2019 as a diet that people are following. And if you see, the plant-based diet actually ranked somewhere in the middle of diets people tried. And if you look at the actual list, uh, many of these diets are plant-based, like clean eating, gluten-free, Mediterranean diet. 
And the truth is over half of Americans are interested in eating more plant-based. And you can see some of the statistics here. 0.5% uh, of U.S. population is vegan, 2% are vegetarian, 55% are trying to add more plant-based uh, foods to their diet, and 36% of meat eaters are trying to, are trying to add more plant-based uh, foods to their diet as well. This slide uh, comes from um, the Dietary Guidelines, the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines, and the reality is that nearly 9, in, nine out of 10 Americans fall short on three servings of dairy every day. They also fall short on vegetables, and fruit are not far behind as well. So as health professionals, we really need to educate the public on how to balance and increase these foods. And so let's just take a look at the nutrient package found in dairy foods. So as you know, milk contains a powerful nutrient package of nine essential nutrients in each serving. Um, in fact, it's the number one food source of three out of the four under-consumed nutrients of public health concern as identified by the Dietary Guidelines of Americans, calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. Um, milk is also a primary ingredient for yogurt, which has seven nutrients, and cheese, uh, which provides six nutrients. Occasionally, we hear people say that it's easy to replace calcium in milk with other foods like leafy greens or dairy alternatives. But I love kale, but you would need 17 cups of raw kale to equal the calcium in three servings of milk. Now, that's a lot of kale. Um, you would need to eat four hard-boiled eggs to um, equal the protein in three servings of milk and three cups of cooked kidney beans to equal the phosphorus in three servings of milk. So if you look at plants, plants provide complementary nutrients. And you can see a whole variety, potassium, vitamin A, folate, fiber, um, and even not only fruits and vegetables, but you have fiber uh, and B vitamins in grains, fiber in beans, vitamin E in seeds and nuts. Um, and also in nuts, you have some unsaturated fats. And let's look at um, plant-based perspective. So plant-based eating has been top has been topping consumer food and nutrition uh, trend list for the past several years, and it's been included in the dietary guidelines. What many people don't, realizing is, don't realize is that plant-based doesn't mean plants only. And you can see all the um, eating patterns, the U.S. Uh, healthy style, healthy vegetarian, healthy Mediterranean, all call for dairy. So the only difference you can see is the healthy Mediterranean style eating pattern has two servings of low-fat or fat-free dairy foods per day, and it actually has higher seafood and fruit. But that also means that the Mediterranean diet has less calcium and vitamin D as uh, compared to the U.S.-style healthy eating pattern. And it's interesting to note um, that the Mediterranean diet has actually 700 to 800 milligrams of calcium and falls 200 to 600 milligrams below what's recommended in the U.S. depending on age and gender. So let's look at the study from uh, Nutrients, um, the publication Nutrients. It's a 2015 modeling study using NHANES data, and they found a mix of plant foods and dairy foods have the best chance of closing nutrient gaps in common di uh, diet consumption patterns of Americans. So what they did was they had three dietary scenarios by doubling the intake of plant-based foods protein-rich plant-based foods like legumes and nuts and dairy foods, milk, cheese, and yogurt. And you can see here, when they doubled the usually consumed plant-based foods, they improved the intake of numerous nutrients. But there was still insufficient intake of calcium, vitamin D, vitamin A, and protein. When they doubled the milk, cheese, and yogurt, you can see that, and the asterisk nutrients are those that are under-consumed by Americans. So when you double the milk, cheese, and yogurt, the calcium and vitamin D which was insufficient when you doubled the plant-based food, actually improved the intakes along with vitamin A, protein, and magnesium. So this study really, it nicely illustrates that it's not plant versus animal foods, but rather plant plus animal foods to really help close the nutrient gaps that exist among Americans over the age of two. But there's another aspect that we have to remember. There are culinary attributes to plant, to plant foods. 
So, for example, you have nuts and seeds, and they add crunch and creaminess. And if you roast them, like I do before some recipes, it adds a more complex flavor. So, for example, if you add nuts and ricotta cheese with strawberries, you'll get an extra crunchiness there. Nut butters, if you want to use a peanut butter, almond butter, it adds creaminess to recipes. Vegetables add color, flavor, and texture, and it depends on raw versus cooked. There'll be a little bit different texture. And you can see a salad with green lettuce, yellow peppers, orange carrots, and that visual just helps entice people. Starchy vegetables and legumes, they can act as a thickener, like uh, pureed potatoes or beans can help thicken soups. Fruits can add sweetness, texture, and color as well. For example, I have a broccoli salad in my Greek yogurt chicken and uh, Greek yogurt kitchen, sorry. And it adds, um, and I added dried cranberries to help balance that flavor. Blueberries in a yogurt parfait is another example. And then whole grains add nutty, uh, add a nutty flavor, a texture, a mouthfeel. Uh, a good example is oatmeal with milk. Dairy foods as well, they add culinary attributes. So butter adds body depth and that silky smooth mouthfeel. So you just need a little bit. It could be a tablespoon, a teaspoon of butter into some cooked vegetables. Uh, milk adds texture, creaminess, and foam. Who doesn't like that? Foams milk with their coffee. Um, whole milk could be added to soup for creaminess. Um, with cheese, it also adds creaminess, that creamy mac and cheese. Or it could add flavor, like blue cheese crumbles on a salad. And yogurt, it's a fermented food. It also adds moisture, creaminess, tang, and acidity. So in baking, um, in baked goods like cake, it adds some moisture and tang. And also it's mild acidity and calcium as, uh, is a natural tenderizer for meat. So based on the research, there are certainly benefits of adding dairy plus plants into your diet, and it adds nutrients, health benefits, texture, flavor, and tasty satisfaction too. And so like we demonstrated in the previous slides, many Americans are not reaching for the recommended amounts of vegetables or dairy or even fruit on a daily basis. So research demonstrates that dairy in combination with vegetables and fruits can help close those nutrient gaps. And so you don't need a recipe to make this power couple of dairy and, and, and plant foods, okay? So some combinations you can use are you can make a savory cottage cheese with like everything bagel seasoning, some vegetables like tomatoes, cucumbers, and radishes. You can make or buy a labna, which is a yogurt cheese. It's, it's, I'll show you a picture of it in a bit. Um, you can drizzle it with olive oil, and you can use pita or a whole grain cracker in it a cheese board with nuts and whole grains and figs, um, fresh grapes, dried fruit. I mean, these are all power food, uh, superfood power couples. And so I'm actually going to ask you, what's your favorite superfood couple? And I'd love for you to take the challenge. And you can actually check my Instagram page to see this acai bowl. My girls are absolutely obsessed lately. Um, and so post your um, photo of something with, so this one has Greek yogurt. And then my daughter put acai, she puts, sometimes she puts spinach, and then she decorates it with whatever we have in the house. Here it was some granola, um, strawberries, and blackberries. So take a, a photo of your favorite superfood couple of dairy plus plants posted to Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Please use the hashtag have a plant with dairy and hashtag National Dairy Month, and tag me. I love, I love seeing food photography. I love to see what you eat. Also tag fruits and vegetables, uh, fruits and veggies, sorry, that's the Produce for Better Health uh, handle, and also National Dairy Council, it's NTL Dairy Council on Twitter. And I'm actually going to call somebody out on my Instagram. You can actually take a look at lives now. And I'm challenging them specifically along with all of you to post your favorite superfood power couple. So let's just quickly take a look at some um, food photos. You know, it's, it's kind of almost lunchtime, around lunchtime. So here's some homemade labna with uh, Greek yogurt. You strain it for 24 to 48 hours. You can actually put something called zatar, which is a spice blend of sumac, toasted sesame seeds, thyme, and salt. And then, like I said, you can drizzle it with some EVOO and then pair it with veggies or whole grain, whole grain crackers, let's say. This is from my um, Healthy Meal Prep Cookbook. 
uh, an example with the nuts at, uh, at the crunch, and then I have ricotta cheese here with strawberries. Um, this is from my Create Your Plate Diabetes Cookbook. It's a pear and almond overnight oats. So it's using oats with nonfat milk and Greek yogurt along with some nuts and fruit. A veggie egg scramble, again, from your, uh, my Create Your Plate Diabetes Cookbook. So here I have some reduced fat cheddar cheese, eggs, vegetables, apples, whole grains. My salad parfait from the Greek Yogurt Kitchen. I love it. It has some um, chopped herbs in the center over there with the Greek yogurt. And it has a white balsamic vinaigrette. So you can actually put it in a glass um, cup or container, and it looks really pretty. And then here are zucchini fritters with a yogurt sauce. So this is also from my Create Your Plate Diabetes cookbook. And some Turkish eggs with Greek yogurt and sauteed spinach, which is unbelievable. Okay, again, here you have Greek yogurt and spinach, tomatoes, basil, eggs, whole grain toast. And then avocado yogurt soup. And I have a soup like this in my Greek yogurt kitchen. And some people ask me, what, well, why are you combining um, with avocados, which are so creamy, yogurt and Greek yogurt and buttermilk. And again, it's to close those nutrient gaps. It's a perfect example. So in conclusion, uh, there are varying interpretations among health professionals and consumers surrounding the meaning of what, what is plant-based. And we know that nearly 9 out of 10 Americans fall short on vegetables and dairy recommendations. And they're food groups for a reason eating patterns that include a variety of foods of plant and animal origin help ensure nutrient needs are met. Dairy foods can help make plant-packed plates even better by adding, like I mentioned, nutrients, health benefits, flavor, texture, and satisfaction. So Sally, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Toby. You know, I was so inspired when we were talking earlier this week about have a plant with dairy um, that I wanted to share some of my own recent dishes to showcase just how easy and delicious this can be. So I really hope the folks on the webinar can <clears throat> join in with us on social as we celebrate um, the great taste, texture, flavor, and nutrition package of these food groups paired together. Um, and as we wrap up, I really hope the participants have a better understanding of the research related to protein quality and quantity and sustainability considerations, as well as how plant foods and animal foods complement each other to help us build not only a healthy but sustainable and delicious eating patterns. And, you know, as, as I think about it, I think quite simply it is the fact that they are better together. Um, I'm going to zip past the next few slides so we have time for Q&A. But I do want to point out that next month, July 15th, we'll be having our next um, Dairy Nurses Life webinar on the food matrix, more than the sum of its nutrients. And I really hope you can all join us for that. It really um, takes a deeper look at, to some of the unique aspects of foods that might go beyond just their uh, specific nutrient profile. So with that, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. As I mentioned before, um, if you have any questions, which we've had quite a few already entered in, so clearly this is a hot topic, but please go ahead and drop them into the chat box on the left. And as a reminder, you'll be getting your continuing ed certificates and handouts within 24 hours, and look for the recording of this webinar on usdairycouncil.com. So with the Q&A, let me pull through our list here. Um, and I think one of the first ones is, um, are you saying it's nearly impossible? This is for Dr. Lehman. Are you saying it's nearly impossible for a vegan to meet lysine and methionine re requirements? Um, you know, that's a good kind of a question. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to emphasize was the difference between the minimum RDA and an optimum for metabolism. So almost all of the plant-based diets are all geared around meeting the minimum. So I was talking about lysine, for example, and the example that I used in the table, and people can go back and look, was the metabolic optimum is 3.4 grams per day. But if you look in the bottom of that same table, the FAO amino acid score requirement is only 2.1. So it's reasonably easy 
for a vegetarian to meet the minimum requirement, but it becomes very difficult without supplemental protein or amino acids to meet the metabolic optimum. So that's the difference you have to think about, and that's why I wanted to emphasize the RDA. We treat the RDA for protein like it's a minimum and a maximum, but there's a metabolic that is much higher than that. Great. Thanks, Dr. Lehman. Uh, another interesting question here. Um, I thought the concept of complementary proteins went out of style, in quotes. No longer correct thinking several years ago. Is this still a nutrition concept to practice, teach, or counsel on? Well, I still taught at the University of Illinois, so I'm not sure whose style it went out of. But, uh, you know, I think that the reality is we almost all eat mixed meals. And so one of the things we should be doing is thinking about how we group them. Uh, Americans currently get most of their plant-based protein from cereal grains, which are really poor, both in amino acid quality and bioavailability. So what do you match those up with? You know, what if you're going to be, is it going to be complementary with animal products or is it going to be complementary with other plant products? You can do it either way, but how you match those up is very important. And that's one of my comments at the end. Do the average American have the food skills to do that right at a plant-based diet at minimum protein levels? I, I, my observation is most Americans can't put that together. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, one more for Dr. Lehman, and then we'll jump to Toby for a few questions. Um, so what are your thoughts on the whole foods plant-based diet, eating 95% of foods from plants and 5% from animal? with regards to getting enough protein? Uh, I'm not directly familiar with that, but I would guess if you go to look, it's based on meeting the RDA for protein. So again, it's based on designing it around the absolute minimum to not have a deficiency. And obviously, having some plant-based diet, uh, whether it's dairy or eggs or meat, greatly increases the chances of meeting those amino acids that are particularly deficient in, in um, lysine and methionine. But it also helps with things like you know, calcium and vitamin D and B12 that are also pretty low in plant-based foods. Okay. Thank you. All right, Toby, I'm going to um, switch over to you for a few questions. Um, first of all, there's a few questions on people wanting to know um, but if it's slides that you referenced, where can they locate those? Um, you can go to the, I think you can go to the, um, the IFIC website. They should have it there. And they just came out with their uh, newest um, uh, survey as well in the, the past day or two. So go to the, go, Google their website and you can find it there. Yeah, I just saw that too. I think it was yesterday they released their 2020 um, survey, and IFIC always has a lot of great information. So, yeah, I think it's just a matter of Googling that website. Um, okay, um, some other questions. Mediterranean diet only recommends uh, two servings um, in calcium. Will people need more calcium to meet recommendations? Can't they make it up from nuts? So um, if you remember one of the slides I uh, spoke about, you would need, like, it was something around, you know, 15 or so uh, cups of kale to meet the calcium. So even by taking in nuts, you're not going to meet all those nutrients in the same amount, and you'll need a lot more, which means excess calories, because, you know, nuts certainly are calorie-dense, though they're very nutritious as well. So those nutrients that you find in milk, yogurt, cheese, um, are real, you can't get it in with any other food in the same amount. Okay, okay. Um, and another question on how legumes fit on the plate. Um, so legumes, which is uh, beans, peas, beans, peas, and lentils, sorry, um, they actually can count. It's really interesting. The dietary guidelines count them either as a, you could do it as a plant-based protein, or you can count it as in the vegetable group, but you can't, you can't count both. Um, so they certainly can fit on the plate in, in a variety of ways. Yeah, I think that, that's a, a great point that, you know, as you mentioned before, Toby, there's food groups for a reason, and all these various uh, foods and food groups are bringing different nutrients. Um, to the plate. So um, 
again, I think it goes right. back to that better together concept. It's fantastic. Um, I think Absolutely. we have time. We're, we're at, at time. Um, one last mm -hmm. question. Um, it says, do you recommend whole milk for all 